This great big tower behind me here, that I'm going to be climbing up in a minute, is on Colshot Spit and it has a view of the whole of the shipping coming into Southampton. They come from both sides of the Isle of Wight, yachts come past it from the Hamble River and everywhere else, powerboats, Isle of Wight ferries, dredgers, everything you can think of all comes past here and it's all watched and recorded. And you'd imagine that this was being done by the MCA, the official Marine Coast Guard Agency reporting to Her Majesty. But it's not. It's operated by the National Coast Watch Institution, which is an entirely voluntary organisation, which runs this place and many others around the coast that used to be run by the Marine Coast Guard Agency. Back in the early 1990s, probably due to financial pressures, and certainly as a result of increasing technology and the things technology were able to do for us and remove the need for human beings, so it was imagined. Most of the Coast Watch small huts that used to look out and see what was going on, report back to the authorities and coordinate rescue operations run by people who understood the coast as well as they understood their own backyards. These places were closed down and it was not popular amongst seamen. I personally was very disappointed to see this happening because it did give you a feeling of security to know that these great guys were up there looking after you. Shortly after these stations had closed, two fishermen were lost off Bass Point in Cornwall, right underneath the deserted Coast Guard station. And this was too much for the local Cornish people. They just couldn't cope with this. They decided, we've got to do something about this. And they clubbed together, they banded together, they got proper people up there who knew what they were doing and they manned it themselves. They did the job. And so the National Coast Watch Institution was founded. It spread rapidly because other communities realised full well that they were missing their little Coast Watch stations. And soon they were set up all over the country. Now we've got 57 of these stations fully operational with trained people running them who know what they're about. They're well equipped with all sorts of material goods in there and they're doing a great job. They're liaising with the authorities. They're also liaising with the lifeboat people. And sometimes they actually coordinate their own rescues. They do it themselves because they know the water. And as Robin Knox Johnson himself said, you cannot beat Mark One Eyeball. Technology is all right. But what I want when I'm out there is to know that there's somebody watching me. And that's what happens. And that's what we've got up there. Here, and it's a long climb but Roger's here Roger Taylor who's the deputy manager of the station um, he's going to put us straight so Roger what goes on on a daily basis up here what's what's going on these chaps and okay when we first arrive into the station um, all the radios go on all the equipment goes on a very quick check to make sure everything works uh, we then uh, contact the Coast Guard after we checked on the weather forecast locally just around the station um, so they then get an idea of what it's actually like here. They then can ask us various questions of what they can see or any information that we need to know of any ongoing incidents, etc. Um, and they will pass that back to us. Uh, we then make a broadcast uh, on Channel 65. Is that your standing channel? 65? It is indeed. Yeah. It is indeed, yeah. So this is to all the local mariners so we can tell them what the uh, weather conditions are around and about. And if there are any other warnings from the Coast Guard, we will put it over as well. But generally, we stick to the weather. We do it locally here, what we can see and what we have here. So can people call you up for that information? If yes. I was at Hamble wondering whether to go sailing for the day, could yes. I give you a shout and say, what's it actually like up there? Indeed, that happens quite regularly. Um, we've had some days which have been a bit um, bumpy out there. <laughs> and we've had people contact from the Hamble saying, it's nice and calm in the hand, but what's it actually like out in the middle of the Solent? So we can give them a rough estimate of the wave heights, wind speeds and direction of tides. That's fantastically useful today because, you know, all the weather forecasts, everyone's gathering all these weather forecasts off the, off the internet and they all say, oh, it's going to be 15 knots with gusts of 25 knots. 
Well, everybody loves 15 knots, but nobody wants 25. <laughs> so being able to just call you up yeah. and you can yes, tell them what it really is. Yes. That is the essence of what we do to, at the start of the day. Yeah. yeah. We have a log book which we actually we maintain throughout the day, throughout the shifts. What we've done, who we've contacted, when we've started, when we've finished. Any incidents that occur, we log them immediately into the book and we record what happens at the various critical stages. We're talking with the Coast Guard as well and informing them of incidents. So a line is kept open and we're literally giving them a running commentary of any incidents that do occur. Yeah, because I mean if a big ship gets into difficulties, I can see they're going to probably know all about it. But, but if somebody falls off a, off, a, off a wind kite down there on Carlshot Spit, they're not going to have a clue, are they? No. But you are. Not, yeah, yes we are. Yeah. One, of the, uh, one of the last ones that we dealt with was a chap hanging on to the reach buoy. Uh, looks a long way away, but he was there with his kite. It was the cold weather. Uh, I think really what had happened, he'd, he got cold and this had taken the strength away from him. Yeah. He was in the water, couldn't get the kite up. So he was hanging onto this boy. And every now and again, he was waving if he couldn't hang him back onto the boy. So again, that's when we contacted the Coast Guard about. We kept the running commentary going. The Cowshot lifeboat crew, excellent guys that they are, went straight out, picked him up, brought him back. And they had to warm him up a bit. Uh, and get him, get him back to back to the beach across the way. And it all came from you in the first place. That's what it's all about, really, it isn't is. it? It's having yeah. eyeballs to see what's happening. So, uh, we we keep a continual watch. We continually sweep across and look yeah. for anything that looks out of place or a problem. While we're up here, I can't let this opportunity pass without talking a little bit about some of the sheds that are down here on Colshot Spit. The great big one dates back, really, historically to the First World War. It probably is a new shed, or it certainly will have been reclad. But in World War I, flying boats started to become a proposition, and the Royal Flying Corps, which became the Royal Air Force, used this place to operate them from. And it's absolutely ideal, because you've got a great big expanse of water that in any halfway reasonable conditions is going to be flat which is exactly what they want you've got enough space to be able to take off into the wind from any position so it's a perfect place for flying boats and as time went on and flying boats got bigger in the years between the wars and in world war ii the great big sunderland flying boats and the like were operated from here big four engine aircraft and they were fascinating and, and their history, little bits of their history has trickled down and can be found in all sorts of places here. I once bought myself a marine toilet, a baby Blake, that it was, it wasn't like a proper bronze one, it seemed to be made of light alloy and there were even holes punched in the handles to make them lighter and it turned out it was built for a Sunderland flying boat and there it was, I bought it in a junk shop. So these things historically come down to haunt us and the smaller shed over there is called the Schneider Hangar. Between the wars, this area again was used by seaplanes and particularly for competition seaplanes for the great international Schneider Trophy, which was a speed race for seaplanes. And the champion seaplane of all time, really, which was operated from here, was the Supermarine S6B. And that aircraft led directly to the development of the Supermarine Spitfire. So, Historically, the place is just oozing with it. What a place to be. Yeah. Oh, pretty nice, well, here comes the morning Linda from who knows where, loaded with cars for the British Isles, coming in past Colshot Tower. Now, you would think, wouldn't you, that this is all so well organised, this bit of water. What can possibly go wrong? Well, you always need an eyeball to look at things because just last year, one of these ships came out of Southampton that something had gone dodgy with the survey, things weren't quite right, the pilot didn't like the feel of it, he went round a tight corner down past the boy round there. He hated the feel of the ship as she went round, she felt positively crank, he had a word with the captain. Skipper didn't like it either and they let her drift quietly onto a sandbank and there she stayed for some time, several tides. And these guys saw it all. They were able to tell people what was going on who needed to know because nobody has got a view like this. So well done, the National Coast Watch. 
You were telling me about a, a, a powerboat that something happened out here. And it was, yes. It was um, a pre, I think it was pre-preparation of this powerboat for the um, Cows Torquay race. Yeah. And they had been out r running it up and down through here. And they come back and exactly what happened, I don't know, but they struck the, the spit boy, Hamble spit boy. They never did. It lifted the boat up, spun it over oh. and it crashed down. Um, <laughs> And there was a bit of confusion from some of the boats as to where it actually was. Uh, but we were then able to ring the Coast Guard again and say, we can see it. It is the Hamble Spit Boy. We gave them a latitude and a longitude. And then the lifeboats were then tasked to go out to that incident. It can get very confusing, those first few minutes of any incident. So I think we provide the clarity. Uh, and the Coast Guard have come to trust our judgment now as well. Anything that helps to save a life is, is a good thing. And some of the outlying stations, they must do really important work. Every station is different, but down through to the West Country, where they get the full force with the Atlantic coming in, and that's another thing again. Yeah. Often, if something has happened, those stations on the cliffs down through uh, Cornwall and Devon are the only ones who have seen what's happened. And they're the only ones that are reporting that back to the Coast Guard. We've built up such a good rapport now with the Coast Guard. Yeah. They will often come and talk to us about things which are ongoing, which they can't resolve uh, yeah. when they're in their watch areas. Yeah. And how's it funded, Roger? Oh, voluntary. Uh, all it by, really? All by donations. How do people contribute if they want to do that? We have a website, nci.org.uk. Yeah. And there is, if you go look through that website, it's quite interesting. You just catch all the stations. You can see them all. And at the bottom, there is an area where you can donate. Roger, that's really illuminating, and uh, thanks very much. I hope a lot of people watch this little video and find out more about what you're doing, because it's terrific. Thank you for having us. It's our pleasure entirely.